Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the kickoff of our distinguished lecture program this year at the Virginia Tech Carolian Research Institute. Um, it's a pleasure to have everybody here and see a great uh, opening audience. This is a, a special day in many ways, not only because of the wonderful speaker we have, but there's some other things going on I want to share with you first before I introduce today's speaker. Uh, but firstly, I want to remind you the next uh, talk in the public lecture series will be October 19th. Uh, it'll be by Dr. Mark Baer, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and the Picawar Professor of Neuroscience in the, De Brain, in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Uh, Dr. Baer will be talking about his work on Fragile X Syndrome and other related developmental disabilities. And for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Baer is an old friend and colleague of mine, has been very involved uh, from very fundamental basic laboratory research to moving out uh, into developing therapeutics, working with families and interest groups across the country. Uh, to develop company and deliver therapeutics for developmental disorders. So I think he's going to tell a wonderful story that we call uh, Bench to Bedside and Beyond into the community about the realities of scientific discovery and actually doing something and having an impact on, on the health of the community. So hopefully many of you will be able to be here for that. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to uh, tell people one of the reasons today is a special day. As we, many of you know, we just came over from another event uh, an hour or so ago uh, in the building next door, which was the official launch uh, and blue ribbon cutting ceremony for the new Center for Transformative Research on Health Behaviors, directed by Dr. Warren Bickle and Dr. Matt Hulver sitting in the front row. And please join me in congratulating them. <laughs> And uh, again, I, I'm not going to go through all the speeches from before, but I do want to say this represents a truly unique initiative uh, that partners not only Virginia Tech and Curlian Clinic, uh, Virginia Tech here in Roanoke, but also the main Virginia Tech campus in Blacksburg. Dr. Hulver leads a program in the uh, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Blacksburg. And of course, many of you know Dr. Bickle here in Roanoke leads the Addiction Recovery Research Center. <clears throat> and so that partnership with the Carilion Clinic partnership, I think, has really created a, a real force of nature in terms of the discovery and innovation you'll be seeing coming out of this new program. So we're, we're really enthusiastic about it. And thanks, uh, Matt and Warren, for all you do in that regard. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before introducing today's speaker is some of you may recognize today's speaker. Many of you may, of course, from knowing him from the literature and so forth, but others who have come to the lecture series may recognize him, because I had, I had just briefly forgotten that Dr. Epstein actually was one of our first keynote speakers in our program, and I looked back to check on the date. It was February 23rd and 24th, 2012. You were here, Alan, in case you forgot. Uh, anyway, based on that and my recollections, I'm sure we're in for uh, a real treat, because uh, he gave a fantastic presentation. I know he will again. I don't want to put any pressure on him, though. But anyway, by way of introduction then, let me please uh, uh, try to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Leonard Epstein. He is the State University of New York Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, uh, where he's also the Chief of Behavioral Medicine at Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, University of Buffalo, SUNY. Uh, <clears throat> he has uh, won numerous awards and accolades, of which there is not time to go over them. I'll just mention a couple briefly. He's a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Science. Uh, Society of Behavioral Medicine uh, elected him as a distinguished scientist. Uh, he's former president of the American Psychological Association Division of Health Psychology. <clears throat> he's uh, received the American Psychological Association Award for Outstanding Contributions to Health Psychology. He's chaired numerous important uh, groups at the National Institutes of Health on behavioral medicine, including study sections, serving on the advisory board at CSR at NIH. And it's interesting. Um, I don't know if we need to update uh, his uh, website or CV. I notice it says he has over 300 publications. Well, last night at about 2 in the morning, as my wife knows when I'm sitting there, as my wife knows when I'm sitting there reading over papers of the speaker coming in, I was, I was going through his papers, and all of a sudden I was on PubMed. I got to number 413. I said, wait a minute. He has more than 300. He has more than 400 publications. So we have to get that updated on your site. 500 now. <laughs> so it, 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 keeps, it keeps coming. <clears throat> and also he's been... Uh, author of uh, several really important books. Uh, one of the books uh, that many of you have heard about is The Stoplight uh, Diet for Children that uh, came out um, uh, several years ago uh, in an eight-week program. And one of the things that really touches on and has advice scientifically grounded for children and parents and families, how to have a healthy lifestyle going forward. Uh, and it's one of the things I like very much about Dr. Epstein's work. It, it, it's directed at individuals and understanding and studying them, but also takes into account always a what I call the ecosystem of the family and the setting and the context of real world and real life stuff. So uh, he's, he's made major contributions in many respects. Um, <clears throat> he studied health behavior changes and determinants of eating, physical activity, uh, drug self-administration, uh, childhood obesity as a 
a major focus area, and as everybody knows, a major health issue that we face as a society, weight control and family interactions and that dynamic that I alluded to earlier. Uh, he studied and produced uh, numerous papers of importance on levels of food reinforcement related to working memory capacity, for example, and begin to understand the neurobiological mechanisms that go in uh, to these reinforcers and how our behavior is modified. But what I most admire about Dr. Epstein's work is he really takes on the hard, hard uh, problems and subjects. And so he's, he's looked in, for example, to tax it, taxes and subsidies uh, for levels of caloric uh, intake and how these affect this and reduce calories, uh, what food subsidies do in terms of calories people purchase when they're out you know, in the real world and changing and affecting the nutrient quality in their overall life. These are obviously complicated issues of economics, of human behavior, of biology, and the interplay is complex, and it takes really great mind and an innovative approach to, to give us inroads into those areas. And Dr. Epstein has been and continues to be a true force in nature in that regard. So I'm very honored to have him here today with the grand opening of the new center uh, for Warren and Matt. I think he's the perfectly appropriate person to kick this off. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leonard Epstein. Thank you, Mike. It's a very nice introduction. Pleased to be here. Um, I have been here before. Um, this is great to um, see old friends, and see, see people I haven't seen for many years from the Blacksburg campus, um, talking about research for the last couple of days, and then I've really been looking forward to, to this talk. So this talk is not going to be a talk on my research. It's going to be a talk on transformational research and where ideas come from. Um, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that I think will entertain you and teach you some, uh, some new things. So let me get started. So the idea of transformative research um, is really a big thing now. Um, the idea of doing paradigm shifting research of, of doing things that are different. Now, that is not the way we usually do research. And when we train people, we don't train people to do innovative, creative work. We train them to do what everybody else has done and maybe do a little bit of incremental difference. So I'm going to talk totally differently about a different paradigm. So when um, people usually think about how research is going to go, um, they, they use this, this idea, um, Newton's idea. And it was originally, actually, Bernard of Chartres in the 12th century talked about the idea that discoveries are based on previous discoveries. And of course, that's how we train people, isn't it? Um, we make them read all the literature that's ever been done on some topic, and then they do a little bit different, um, and then they keep doing a little bit different, and they have systematic research program, and it's going along nice, and that's usual science. Um, there's nothing at all wrong with usual science, but that's not transformative science. Transformative science is when you're putting brand new things together. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. This um, is a stamp about Sputnik. So Sputnik happened, or was put into launch, on October 4th, 1957. So it's almost 60 years ago Sputnik was launched. So Sputnik, of course, was launched by Russia. And at the time, we thought we were the most scientifically advanced nation in the world. And boy, were we embarrassed when the Russians put up Sputnik. But this is a really big deal. This is something that got people really excited. So at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, they were watching this. this I don't know if any of you remember, if any of you are over 60, but this was on TV everywhere. So of course, in, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, there was a big TV in the cafeteria, and all the physicists are watching. And this is like gold for the physicists. This is stuff they've been thinking about and talking about forever. So they're watching this. They're watching Sputnik. And two of these guys, these young guys, Geyer 
and wife and back. Um, they say this is an historic event. Let's go back and record this, okay? So Weifenbach was a, um, had some recording equipment in his office, and they leave the cafeteria, and they go to his office, and they start trying to record it. Now, Russia put out a really big signal because they wanted to make sure that people didn't think this was fake. So they put out a signal that was really easy to detect, right? So this signal's going out, and they're, they have their, 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 their recording equipment, they're turning their dials. You remember those? I mean, this is big stuff. This is a big reel-to-reel. -reel. And they're, they're dialing it in, and they're, oh, they finally get a bip, 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 bip. So now they got it. They got the signal, and they're listening for a while. And now other people from the lab come by. I mean, this is exciting stuff. This is history making. They're recording it, so there's a record of it. And there's all, all these physicists now are, are standing in the doorway, um, and these two guys are you know, doing the recording. So they're, they're listening. It goes, bip, 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 bip. So they realize that the frequency changes, right? Now, that's the Doppler effect, isn't it? For those of you who remember, if you're not onto your current physics. So the Doppler effect is based on the idea of detecting things in motion. So in the frequency of a sound will change. So it's just exactly like if you, um, if you hear an ambulance go by, the frequency of the sound will actually change as it gets closer to you, it will change as it gets further away. So um, they start to realize this, and they then, somebody in the audience says, um, you know, why don't we look at the intervals? Why don't we try to figure out um, the intervals and what's going on? So they had a UNIVAC computer. <laughs> that was a big deal then. Um, now, of course, you have a computer in your pocket, right? But at that time, they didn't. There was a UNIVAC computer, and they went to the UNIVAC computer, and they put this this data in, and within a couple of weeks, they were able to plot the complete trajectory of Sputnik. Boy, that was really exciting. They were big shots. Wow. Everybody was really excited. So um, a couple of weeks later, um, McClure comes by, and he's their boss. So he says, you know, I heard you guys got this discovery that you did this, you figured this thing out about the trajectory of Sputnik. That's really cool, but you know, I have a problem. We have some nuclear subs, and it's hard for us to aim because we don't know exactly where the nuclear subs are. You know, we sort of know they're in the ocean and by over here, but we don't know exactly where. If you don't know exactly where, it's hard to, to aim to, to hit something. And we might want to eventually, you know, have to use. So he said, you know, I, I heard that you guys from a stationary place here on Earth could figure out the trajectory of a moving object in space. Can we, can we flip it? Okay, can we flip it so that you can tell um, from a moving object in space what's going on here? So it was just reverse. So they did their calculations, got their slide rules out, and computers, and they figured this out, and they said, yeah. So we can do that. If we put a satellite in space and you send signals down, I can tell you exactly where the submarine is. That's the beginning of GPS, the very first idea about GPS. Now, this did not come from any theory. They didn't read any literature. What are previous ideas about GPS that we're going to follow? This came out of the clear blue. This was a bunch of guys who knew different things, put this stuff together, and boom. A brand, new, a brand new idea. And I bet you most of you have used GPS in the last, maybe if not today, in the last week. I know I had it when I was on my bike ride today just to make sure I knew where I was going. That was the beginning of it. It didn't come from any theory. It, didn't, it came 
from a bunch of people with different expertise coming together. So that's an important idea. Chance favors the connected mind. A lot of major discoveries in science come about by taking advantage of some unusual finding. Lots of times scientists say, that's no good, that's bad data. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. But boy, that can really lead to the newest things. So you got to have a connected mind. you got to have a bunch of people or a person with a lot of expertise and taking advantage of sparks. When I think about innovation and creativity, I think about ideas sort of banging around. You know, you learn this here, and then a couple of weeks later, you learn that there, and a year later, you learn that there. And then you're taking a shower in the morning, and all of a sudden, they come together, and boom, is a new idea. Not based on any previous anything. It really comes together. It can be within the person, or it can be a bunch of people um, having ideas. Okay, so that's one really, I think, a really cool example of this. I'm going to tell you another example. So, um, Germany developed the very first guided missiles, the V-2 rockets, right? This is a newsreel. Boy, they scared everybody. A terrifying new weapon, the V-2, is being aimed at London. The rocket arrives without warning and causes widespread devastation. It generates new terror for Londoners who have already suffered from nightly bombing raids by the Luftwaffe. This was a, this was a really big deal. Um, these just came out of the sky. And of course, they had these shelters that you're supposed to get into. I mean, nobody knew what to do. In, in the US, in the Allies, had no, nothing to combat the V-2 rocket. Um, so in order to be able to have a guided missile, you need two things. You need a payload, right? And you need something to guide it, or a honing device. So. B.F. Skinner. So B.F. Skinner was a junior faculty member at University of Minnesota. Probably most of you have heard of B.F. Skinner. You would think of him being at Harvard. <clears throat> he did his, most of his really famous stuff. But at the time, Harvard didn't, he got his PhD from Harvard, but they didn't appoint people directly to professorships. You had to demonstrate that you could be promoted at another major university before Harvard would bring you back as a tenured faculty. So he was at Minnesota. And he was really junior. And he decided he was going to tackle this. And the way he did it was so fascinating and led to so many innovations. So remember, we needed a honing device. So those are pigeons. Pigeons are pretty cool. They fly in formation, and they can zero in on things. So he was um, a basic animal psychologist, 
and he said, well, maybe we can use pigeons. So he was in his backyard one day seeing those pigeons flying around in formation. In his lab, he did a lot of pigeon research. It's interesting that nowadays, when you think about basic, um, basic neuroscience, you think about rats and mice and stuff. But at one time, pigeons were a popular, if not the most popular, um, subject in, in basic animal labs. So he did a lot of work with pigeons. So he knew pigeons. And he decided he was going to try to use pigeons as the honing device. Now, at the time, the US still did not have a payload. But you needed both. So he was going to devote his time to figuring out this honing device. So he was going to put pigeons as pilots, right? So he, um, he left Minnesota. And he went to General Mills. Now, he was in Minnesota. And General Mills was right there. And he had tried a couple of ways to do um, what he wanted to do. Um, and he wasn't getting very much support. So somebody came by the lab. Um, and they wanted to have dogs um, be uh, commanders of submarines. So that was their idea. And they didn't know very much about dog training and dog behavior, so they needed, some, they needed an animal psychologist to come in and, and get the, uh, the approval of this idea. So this guy came to the lab and he found out what Skinner was doing, and this fellow happened to have contacts at General Mills. So Skinner said, okay, I'm leaving the university, I'm gonna go on sabbatical. This is a junior professor, right? He's gonna solve the problem. <laughs> of V2 rockets, and he left his job in order to take a sabbatical to go to General Mills, and they set him up on the top floor, and he brought his graduate students with him, right? He brought his graduate students, and they were gonna work on this problem. So the first thing they did is they had to make sure that these pigeons could hit targets, okay? So um, they would put the pigeons in these um, jackets, and they put them on one wall, and it was set up so that if the pigeon looked up, they would go up. If the pigeon looked down, they would go down. If the pigeon moved like this, they would go sideways. And in the other wall, over here, there was a big target. And there were seeds in the middle of the target. And they were food deprived. So it was really to their advantage to be able to figure out how to fly from here to there and get their food. So they figured out how to do it. And they were reliable. They could do this all the time. But that, isn't, that isn't gonna, wouldn't be the way that it would work, of course, in a rocket. So the next thing they did was they had a visual system where they um, made a target um, show on a glass plate. Okay? And the pigeons learned to peck the plate in order to move this rocket. So if the pigeons pecked the top of the target, then it would go up. If they pecked the bottom, it would go down and right and left. And they were perfect at it. So this was a visual representation of the target. And they learned to peck to do this. Now, <laughs> I'm sure all of you have done this today. That was the beginning of touch screens. That idea led to touch screens. OK? He didn't know, of course, nobody knew anything about touchscreens then. But that was the first, the first time anybody had used a screen and touching to, to, um, to do something on a, on a device. Um, so he then continued to develop this and develop this. And this was not based on any theories. I mean, he was out there doing what he thought was, uh, was really patriotic. So um, they would put the, uh, pigeons into this nose cone, and that was in the front of this, um, this device. And he had three pigeons. He started off with one pigeon, then he went to three pigeons, just because one of the pigeons might got a little tired, might not be on that day. So he had three of them, and 
Um, if one of them wasn't working, two of them would always work, and he would punish the third one if they weren't zeroing in on the target. So it was really a pretty reliable system. They had all kinds of testing. They went to the Navy to show them this. Um, this is from the um, American History Museum showing the, actu in the actual nose cone. And this is what the, um, the device looked like. So the pigeons were up in the front there. And the payload was there. It was a pelican rocket. That's why they called it um, Project Pelican or, or pigeons in a pelican. So even though there was tremendous data, I mean, he trained these animals. And it, they were really cheap. I mean, it was easy to do. He had reliable methods. Um, they could always hit the target, no problem at all. But he just couldn't convince uh, the Navy um, to do it. They just, they, you know, they said, this is great, but then they looked inside, and there are pigeons. <laughs> are they going to trust defending America to pigeons? They just couldn't do it. Um, so they, they um, disbanded the project. Um, but it's interesting. <laughs> that the final holding device was based on bat echolalia. That was the beginning of radar, right? That's how they guided those first missiles. <clears throat> so <laughs> that's not the end of the story. In fact, that's just the beginning of the story. Um, does anybody know where that um, phrase comes from? The game is afoot. Who's that? Sherlock Holmes, right. So in this case, the game is a foul. So he had these graduate students. He had these graduate students, and they learned all this stuff about pigeon training. And Skidder then went back to Minnesota, he went back to his lab, he started doing his research. Um, but the students got really interested. He had some really good and famous students, Estes. Um, who many of you know is a learning psychologist, was one of, one of those students. And all the students went back with Skidder to start you know, getting their master's or PhD, except for these two guys, um, Keller and Marion Breland. And they were just so fascinated by this animal training that they decided they were going to make it a business. And there was no animal training then. They were going to make it a business. So they bought a farm in Minneapolis. <clears throat> And they started to train animals. So this is um, a, a bunny playing the piano. Now, the um, students um, were Keller and Marion Breland. So this is Skinner's first famous book, The Behavior of Organisms. And Marion Breland was Skinner's second graduate student. She babysat his kids, and she typed up this this manuscript. You remember people actually used to type on paper, and then you would make changes, and somebody would retype it. <laughs> she did that for this book. And when it came out, he gave her the very first copy. So there's some lineage, interesting lineage. But she laughed. She said, this, it's great to be a Skinner student, but boy, this stuff is really, really cool. So there's Keller playing uh, chess with a dog. Now the interesting thing about this um, was they, were, they had made a lot of contacts at General Mills. General Mills had an animal feed program. And it was this Laro uh, feeds. So what the Breland said is, you know, we can, um, we can help you sell feed. We can train animals to do all kinds of cool tricks at these fairs. And all the people are going to come by, and they're going to be at your, your stand, and you're going to sell a lot of feed. So he, they started to train animals to um, do tricks at these, um, at these events. And they had all kinds of really cool tricks that they trained them to do. Um, they had chickens dancing. Um, they had, which I'm going to show you an unbelievable example of, they had um, chickens playing tic-tac-toe. 
Um, chickens learn to count. They could count to nine. And people just loved this. Now, I don't know if, if some of you remember, but there used to be, if you went to like a county fair, um, there would be booths of animals trained, and you put a quarter in, and they would do a trick for you. Um, so they developed, that was the next thing that they developed. It was air-conditioned booths, and these animals never made a mistake. They were terrifically well-trained. And they <clears throat> um, started this IQ Zoo, um, and they moved from um, Minnesota to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And they started doing this really seriously. Now, they did all kinds of really cool things. Um, they also began dolphin training. So they were the first ones to train dolphins. And all the stuff that you see now at Marine Land and such, it's all based on their ideas about how to train dolphins. And also, all of their training was only positive reinforcement. At the time, much of the animal training, it wasn't systematized, but much of it was punishment. If the animal did the wrong thing, they got a swat. They didn't believe in that at all. Neither did Skinner. It was all positive reinforcement. It was all shaping of behavior. And they really made it into a science of how to shape behavior. So this is an example of um, a chicken um, <clears throat> putting, um, having a, a, uh, some music come on and doing a dance. This is Paula, um, the pig. And Paula um, learned, um, they, she had her own little apartment. And she would get up and she would make breakfast. Um, she would clean up. She had a vacuum. Um, and then she would go shopping. And of course, what did she buy when she was shopping? Laro feed, <laughs> right? She bought some more Laro feed. So this was um, something that helped um, General Mills, as well as being a cool thing. They did a lot of animal training um, for commercials. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a great commercial, but it ran for 20 years. You don't see commercials run for 20 years. People are just fascinated by that bunny saving money. Wonder what it was saving for. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was saving, and, and they did a lot of, of that kind of training. So they also, um, as I mentioned before, um, developed these, um, these games that um, people could put a quarter in, and they could see the trick. Or in this case, they could play tic-tac-toe against a chicken. <laughs> now, really, is that a great idea or what? I don't know how many of you think you're good at tic-tac-toe, but these chickens, they, they had the advantage. They went first. OK, they're chickens, right? But they never lost. They were terrific. Now think about how hard it is to train a chicken to play tic-tac-toe. You know, like you've got to teach them to attend. You've got to teach them some basic strategy, right? If, if the guy goes here, then you have to do this. So there was a lot of training that went on. Um, now this is, <clears throat> um, as you can see, this is from Chinatown, a large bag of fortune cookies if you beat the chicken. Now, I gave this talk at NIH last year, and somebody from the audience came up, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, we went to Chinatown every weekend and <laughs> used to play these things. So they, apparently, they still have these things in Chinatown. Um, I don't know who's training the chickens, but... Um, so this is um, from a modern farmer of a, a child who, who are now an adult who is talking about his childhood experience. 
<clears throat> and he said the most unnerving thing was losing tic-tac-toe to a chicken. <laughs> So, um, they, they, they did a lot of, um, of training of animals for, for the, the kinds of things I'm talking about. But they also continued to work with the military. So that's how they really got started, of course, trying to do this pigeon and a pelican thing. But they continued to work um, doing things for the military. Um, so they, they, one of the things they did is teach dogs to detect bombs in Vietnam. Okay? So they did it. It was easy, wasn't hard to do. Um, but that became the basis for um, using dogs to detect drugs. So when you, if you're in an airport and you see a dog being trained to sniff through things, it started there. They also did one other thing that was cool. Um, they, they still um, work with pigeons. So they train pigeons to go ahead of ground troops to see if they were going to be ambushed. So the pigeons would zoom out ahead, and they'd look down, and they were trained to discriminate between enemy, non-enemy. Um, and they would then come back, and they would somehow tell the troops it's safe to go. Or, you know, there's some, there's some Viet Cong over there. and You better watch out. Um, and they were very, very good at it. Um, now, this is all experimental. Um, so they continued to do this um, work for, for the, the government. Um, so um, she went back to, to school 30 years after she left. Marion did. She went back to get her PhD. It took her 11 years to get her PhD. So all this was done when she was a master's, had a master's. So she finally got her PhD, and she then she went to um, University of Arkansas, and then she went to Henderson State, and she taught there as a professor until she was 78 years old. So she said, well, I've done all this really cool stuff. I'm retiring. <clears throat> not to be. Not to be. Didn't retire yet. So this book came out, and some of you may have used this book. Don't shoot the dog. <laughs> it's not the dog's fault. <laughs> it's your fault. Um, and most of the time, it is the trainer's fault, not the dog's fault. So what Karen Pryor did, and one, one really interesting thing, when this book came out, um, there was a New York Times reviewer who reviewed the book from the perspective of what she learned about handling her husband <laughs> from, from these basic principles. <laughs> so it, it had all kinds of, of positive um, generalization. But what she really popularized is clicker training. So many of you may have used clicker training to train your dogs, or maybe even train your cats. So she popularized it, and clicker training was developed by the Breelands as one method to do their their training. So she popularized it, and then all of a sudden, Marion, who was you know, in her 80s, got popular again, and she started to go around and, and speak and teach people how to do this animal training. So I'm going to show you a quick example of clicker training. So that um, was one really interesting example that became very popular. One thing about Marion, Marion had three kids. 
Um, and she, um, Keller died, and she married Bob Bailey, who was a dolphin trader that she met in Marineland. Uh, <clears throat> and he came to work at the Animal Behavior Enterprises, and he brought six kids. So they had nine kids to take care of. But one of Marion's kids at the time was called mentally retarded. Okay? So she done all of this training of animals. And she said, well, can I use these same principles with kids with developmental disabilities? And of course, you can. That began the use of behavioral treatment techniques for developmentally um, disabled children. That was the beginning of it. This is one of the very first examples of it. So I'm going to show you a really nice video. Um, now this has led to lots of different kinds of developments, but the treatment of choice for autistic kids are these techniques. I'm going to just show you a really cool example of this. Wow, great story. And it's all based on the training that they got for pigeons in, for learning to train pigeons, generalizing that to, to kids. So these principles are still being used for all kinds of things. Um, one of the interesting things um, <laughs> that came about um, from the Breland's work um, was this um, misbehavior of organisms paper. They actually published two of those. So at the time, behaviorism was king. Behaviorism could do anything. If you set up the contingencies right, you could do anything you wanted to do. Many of you remember Watson talking about this. Um, now, what the Brelands did, they had trained over 150 different species of animals, and they found sometimes you couldn't train certain animals to do certain things. They said there were, there were in, instincts that got in the way of training. So they wrote his paper, and boy, did they get criticized. Wow, because once again, behaviorism was king. So the idea that somebody would challenge it, particularly one of Skinner's students, was whoa. Um, but they did, and <laughs> Um, of course, they were right that there are um, limits. There are it's tremendously powerful techniques, um, but there are um, species-specific limits. Now, this is that chicken again. Um, so <laughs> um, they were going around to conferences um, showing people how to do their training. Um, and they always used chickens. They thought that chickens were the best kinds of animals to train. They learned really fast, and chickens only had one thing on their mind, food. <laughs> so they weren't distracted by stuff. If you had food around, they paid attention, and they learned really fast. So at, at one of these conferences, um, they brought one of their chickens who could play tic-tac-toe. Very well-trained chicken. And who decided to come by but B.F. Skinner? <laughs> So remember, they were his student. And he also thought he was a really pretty good tic-tac-toe player. So he 
puts his quarter in, he, and the, the chicken won. <laughs> so he kept playing, and the chicken, chicken won every single time. So he was, he was, of course, really proud of his students and how well they turned out. But he also, does that chicken beat me? And then, as the story goes, he went home and started practice. <laughs> practice more uh, tic-tac-toe strategies. Um, so this is just a quote from Kurt Lewin, and I think it really is true that if you, if you have a good theory, and there's really good reason, and I think Mike's talked about this before, is really good basic science that develops principles can easily be extended. And I know a lot of people who do applied stuff just really don't want don't to get down and, and dirty and do the basic stuff, but boy, there's nothing more valuable than understanding how something really, really works. Um, now, one of the places that this, this approach has been used um, really successfully is um, in contingency management for drug use. So now everybody's talking about opioids, right? Everybody's talking about opioid, opioid this and opioid that. Warren was talking about the opioid problem in rural communities before. But in the 90s, people weren't talking about opioids. They were talking about cocaine. They were talking about cocaine exactly the way they're talking about opioids now. We have cocaine everywhere. What are we going to do? Everybody's going to become addicted to cocaine. So this led to people using these principles to treat people with cocaine abuse. They, used the, they reward people for being clean. People would come in to a clinic multiple times. They'd do urinalysis. They would check. And if they were clean, they got reinforced. They got paid. And then they would thin the schedule out. In the beginning, the schedule was they got paid a lot in the beginning. And then as they went along, um, they increased the pay because it gets harder as you're, as you're maintaining the abstinence. And this has been used for all kinds of drugs in all kinds of situations. And the previous slide was, an, uh, was a NIDA handbook. I mean, this became the treatment or a treatment of choice for people with substance abuse. So the real utility from going from these really, really basic principles to clinical situations. And I know there are people in the audience who have used these, these same principles for all kinds of other, other things. So really, really useful. Now, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my work <laughs> in the end. So what I've tried to do is go from basic animal ideas to human application and really talk about sort of where these ideas come from. And we've talked about the beginning of GPS, the beginning of touch screens, the beginning of treating um, children with developmental disabilities. So lots of really cool things have happened. So I'm going to play you some music. Oops, I was going to play you some music. So that's B.B. King, right? Everybody knows B.B. King. I really like the blues. I wish I had a harmonica with me right now. I don't. So the, this thrill is going, what's the thrill is going about? It's that you first time you experience something, the first time you experience something, it can be really exciting. But as you keep experiencing it, it gets less and less exciting. Right? There was a basic principle there. Basic principle is called habituation. So um, I was doing a lot of behavioral pharmacology. And I was also starting to get into obesity. And one of the things um, that pe people in obesity um, think about is why do people get full? OK? So what I was working on at the time was conditioned drug tolerance. So we were doing very basic neuroscience. We were doing drug tolerance research. And as you know, drug tolerance is if you keep giving the same dose of a drug, you keep getting a smaller and smaller effect. That's tolerance. So Shep Siegel. Uh, a psychologist from McMaster came out with a series of studies showing that this is learned. This is a learned phenomenon. I'll tell you the most famous experiment he did. He um, had some rats, and he gave them heroin 
in one environment and saline in the other environment. And he kept doing that. So the animals associated, um, if, the, if the experimenter came by and had this syringe loaded up and they were in this environment, <laughs> they were going to feel really good. And if they got it in this environment, nothing was going to happen. It was saline. They kept doing that day after day after day after day. So the animals started to expect they were going to get heroin in this environment and saline in, in this environment. And they, they counterbalanced the order of the environment. So that it wasn't just that environment, but it was that certain cues were conditioned to anticipating a drug, and certain cues were anticipated to, to getting saline. And then he gave them a large dose. Okay? So if the animals got the dose where they had been getting their dose, almost none of the animals died, 4% of the animals. Died. They were expecting it. They had built tolerance to it. They kept getting the same dose. They were tolerant. And then they got a bigger dose, but very few of them died. If, however, the animals got the drug in the new environment, now these animals had the same amount of experience with the drug. They got the same number of injections. It's just they never got it in this environment. But now they did for the first time. 96% died. Almost all of them had a drug overdose. So Shep started to think, you know, I wonder if a lot of drug overdoses are due to that. Um, and there's some really famous drug overdoses that fit this. Belushi's drug overdose fits this just beautifully. Len Bias's drug overdose fits this beautifully. Um, so Shep Siegel's paper was in science. He then did another paper in science where he went to his local hospital and he interviewed people who had drug overdoses. And he found out that most of them uh, took their usual dose of the drug. It wasn't an overdose in the sense of more drug. It was an overdose in the sense that their body did not develop tolerance in that specific environment, that it was a learned phenomenon. He tells a really famous story of a woman who um, every morning after her mother went to work would shoot up. She did this for years. So um, one day she just shot up, same dose she always did, and her mother came back into the house. Overdosed, mother called the um, ambulance, took her to the hospital, but it was the same usual dose. It was a learned phenomenon. So, wow, I'm thinking, geez, is that really interesting that this kind of a phenomenon can become learned? So I'm thinking, how can I apply this to, to food intake? So um, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called sensory-specific satiety. And that is that you develop um, fullness or satiation specifically to a certain food. Everybody has experienced this. So you're out um, for dinner. So we were at Billy's last night. That's a, yeah, we were at Billy's last night. Great place to eat. So people are eating, and they're, they're eating as much as they want, and they're full, and they're so full, you know, this is a great meal. I, um, and then the dessert tray comes by. <laughs> now, they don't need the calories, right? But all of a sudden, you change the food, and now people want dessert. And you open up your belt or whatever you, you do, and yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a double layer of this or, or that. Um, so the, the satiety was specific okay, to that food. And there's only one um, graph I have, and this is a really, really cool illustration of this phenomenon. Uh, so these are some primates. Um, and these are single cell recordings from the lateral hypothalamus. Okay? These are single cell recordings from the lateral hypothalamus. And, um, they were to a variety of different substances, peanuts, banana, orange, and glucose. And you can see that there's a, there's a lot of activation. Then they kept giving the glucose. And that single cell stopped responding. It was the same amount of glucose they kept getting, but that single cell stopped responding. Okay? You can see that. Then they said, well, let's give it peanut again. And that cell that stopped responding to glucose 
responded to peanut. Cool. And it responded to orange. And it responded to glucose. And then they satiated with banana. The banana went away, but the peanut and orange were still there. That was one individual cell showing the, in the lateral hypothalamus, showing this process of habituation and dishabituation. So I, boy, oh boy, was that cool. So we started a research program on habituation as a mechanism um, for development of, of satiety. And sure enough, it works beautifully. The first study we did was with lemon juice and salivation. So we're measuring salivation in people, and you put some lemon juice in their mouth, and as you know, people salivate all over the place. But if you keep doing it, they, they stop salivating to that really potent salivary stimulus. But then if you give them a different taste, they start salivating again. <laughs> So the, the, the conditioning, the habituation is specific to that food. So this led to a lot of theoretical work. We have a paper in Psych Review on this, and we've finished clinical trials, manipulating this, showing it helps the treatment. Um, we can predict who becomes obese on the basis of this process. So it's really pretty cool, I think. Um, I'm going to show you one other thing um, before we go. Um, and it's on. Um, Episodic future thinking. Episodic future thinking is a procedure that we developed, and now we're using in all kinds of situations. And part of my coming here is to, is to be interacting with Warren about doing more research on episodic future thinking. So this idea, this whole talk is based on where ideas come from. Um, I was walking home one night, and oh, let, let me set this up a little bit. Um, People, um, th th this idea that people discount the future is really an important idea. Um, it's called delayed discounting, and Warren has developed a, a huge amount of research um, showing how important it is. But nobody had figured out how to change it. <laughs> so Warren started to change it. He started to do working memory training. And working memory is related to um, discounting. People with better working memory don't discount the future as much. So he reasoned that if you could train working memory, then you could get people to discount the future more. And um, as this is a core process for lots of behaviors, you could treat behaviors um, in part that way. Um, so I'm watching this. And, and also, working memory training is really hard. It takes a lot of sessions. It's really complicated. So I'm thinking, you know, Warren's ahead of me now. What's going on here? I got to figure out something that also changes delay discounting. So this is sort of in the back of my mind. I'm walking home one night, um, listening to NPR, and this guy comes on and he's talking about the credit card condom. <laughs> it's not sexy at all, I know. It has a sexy word in it, but it's not. It's credit card condom. So what the credit card condom was, was a sleeve that he would put the credit card in. On the sleeve, it said, these are people who wanted to save for a house. But they never did. And many of us have that, right? I want to get this, but you never put any money away. So these are people who needed to, they were not, not rich people, and they needed to save, but they never saved. So he had this little, this little sleeve, and it said, wouldn't you rather be saving for your house? So just envision this situation. This woman gets her paycheck, right? Um, and her bank is in the mall. So she goes to the mall. And she's walking. She's going to go down to the bank. And she walks past the shoe store, right? And she looks in the shoe store. And she has a party on Saturday night. And she just bought a new dress. But she doesn't have shoes for it. So she's walking. She looks in. And she says, I'll just go in. Right? So she goes in. And there are perfect shoes that match her dress. I mean, they are perfect. And she puts them on, you know, just a little bit. And they look perfect. She can just imagine. Everybody's going to say, oh, aren't you beautiful? Where did you get those shoes? Isn't that terrific? She goes up to the cashier. The cashier says, cash or credit. So she says, credit. She pulls out this credit card. And what does it say on it? Wouldn't you rather be saving for your house? Right? So this thing that's in the future is right now. It's now, it's now. So I'm listening to this, thinking, you know, future discounting. 
Can we put this stuff together? And at the very same time, one of my graduate students came by and said, did you read this paper by Peters and Bouchelle in Nature and Neuroscience? <laughs> so no, tell me about it. So they had done tags, future tags. And they would get people to think about the future. And when they were doing their discounting tasks, they would play that tag and boom, people discount the future less. So I thought, wow, <laughs> I can figure this out. So we started to develop this idea of episodic future thinking. And now um, it's, <laughs> it's been replicated all over the world. We've done it for obesity. We've done it for smoking. We've done it for alcohol. And we're, re we're in the process of um, working on doing it for people with prediabetes. Prediabetes is really interesting because most people with prediabetes translate into type 2 diabetes, like 80% do. Now, you would think. If you went to your doctor and your doctor said, you know, you're at really high risk for diabetes, but if you do X, Y, and Z behaviors, you don't have to worry about it. Well, <laughs> they don't do it, right? They don't do it. They discount the future. Well, it's not going to happen to me. It's way off. Um, so it's a really, really, really good sample to do this. So um, I just want to end with the Breelands. This is from their book, Animal Behavior. Look at what they said. This inspiration for creativity and the championing of independent thought may well be our chief legacy to the world. Wow, isn't that cool? So when they look back in their career, it wasn't the content of what they did. It wasn't all these methods that they did. It wasn't developing treatments for autistic kids that they did. It was that they taught people to think for themselves and be creative. So here's my quote. Remember in the beginning, there was Bernard of Chartres in the 12th century? <laughs> here's the 21st century. Ideas are the currency of science. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for a fascinating, entertaining, and informative talk, Dr. Epstein. We have time for a couple questions or comments. The floor is open. Don't be shy. Yep. Thank you for asking. Um, it is not the, oh, uh, the question was, do I have ideas about how to get creativity into training for people? Um, this is a new program, and maybe things could be done differently. The traditional model for graduate training, graduate or postgraduate training, is a usual science model. Um, it's a systematic research program built on ideas. There's a huge emphasis on let's read the literature, let's know what everyone else did, and let's do a little bit of incremental step past it, right? But not too risky, because you hear all the time, if it's too risky, NIH will never fund it, right? You hear that all the time. Um, so what, what we've done in the lab, and partly because of my work on creativity, um, is we've tried to develop ways to nurture that. And we do an idea playground in our lab every week. So most of the time when people have lab meetings, they're talking about the current research they're doing, right? And what are you doing? What are you doing? Let's tinker with it. Let's change it a little bit. This idea playground is none of that. We don't talk about anybody's research at all. It's ideas. People come with a new novel idea they've never heard before. So in the beginning, when we did this for the first six months, I did all of the ideas. I put all the ideas out. So the students just would listen and they would hear what I did. And in the beginning, um, they did what a traditional graduate student would do. They were critical of the idea. Oh, that will never work. Oh, that's a stupid idea. And what about the methods? You know, they didn't have the right control group. And, you know, <laughs> we're talking about ideas here, right? So after a while, they stopped doing that, and they started to think about the ideas and how they could apply 
the ideas to, to problems they're working on. So then I said, okay, now you, you guys have to start coming in with the ideas. So now they had to come up with a new idea that nobody else in the group had ever heard before. So they couldn't read the traditional textbooks they were reading because everybody <laughs> knew that stuff it was already in the textbook, right? So they had to start reading outside of their field. They had to start reading broadly. Everybody read science every single week. Everything they get their hands on that was new and novel. And all of a sudden they started to see that. Oh, let's bring in new ideas. And now what about this? And how would this work? And it just changed the whole frame of reference for the way the lab worked. And uh, we've been unusually um, successful in grantsmanship recently. And I, I, I think it's a lot to do with really being able to take ideas from all over the place and put them together in new ways. Um, so that's what we do in the lab. Is we have this idea playground. And it's, it's similar to sand pits, but it's or condensed. Many of you may know what sand pits are, but it's, it's, a, it's the same idea. But in sand pits, people go for days and days and days. So we're trying to concentrate this into, into new ideas. Does that help? So I have a, a question. The uh, credit card problem. So how, how long can you uh, continue to suppress uh, the immediate desire to come up again and again, no shoes, no shirt, whatever it is, until until some other circuit takes over and says, you're full of here. <laughs> I'm not getting that house yet. Indefinitely? Um, you know, that's one of the questions that we keep thinking about ourselves. Right now, we're dealing with the immediate decision, we're thinking that every time you would have a decision, you would have to engage in EFT again. There are huge differences in how people approach um, problems. Some people are very prospective. They're always thinking about how my current behavior influences the outcome. You know, when I gave this, when I set this talk up, I did a lot of prospection. I'm thinking, will this um, lead to a, 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 some laughter? Is this a good idea? Will people understand this? And I'm trying, as I'm developing my slides, to think about how people will respond. Um, so I, I just naturally do this, but a lot of people don't do it. So what we would like to do is develop techniques that make prospection the default choice. The default choice. Um, and we're talking about variety of conditioning approaches um, and ways to reframe things that would get people to not be impulsive, but rather for the, their default mode to be thinking about the future. That's, that's in the future, for sure. Um, but that, that's our eventual goal. And are there likely to be genotypes that are more successful? There, there are, yes, there are genotypes that are related to, to discounting. Um, one of the things that's really unique about the stuff that, that Warren's been doing and I'm doing with him now is the idea of looking at the brain mechanisms um, related to this. And we actually did have a really interesting finding. Um, hasn't been, I, I'm going to talk about the reinforcement pathology idea. Um, so um, delayed discounting is important. Being impulsive is important. But it's also, um, the other part of the issue is finding something rewarding. Um, so if you have both of those things, if you really are compelled to do something and you have poor self-control, it's a hot spot. It's, you're going to have difficulty. Um, if, on the other hand, you have really good self-control, even if something is very rewarding, it, it doesn't look like it's a huge problem. So um, foodies love food, but many foodies are really slim because they have really exquisite self-control. On the other hand, if I said, after this talk is over, I got some liver popsicles up here. I mean, nobody, nobody finds liver popsicles reinforcing, so you don't engage in any self-control to say, I'm not having a liver, liver popsicle. But if you have those two things together, then all of a sudden it creates a big problem. You're compelled to do this, and you have really poor self-control. So we've been studying this in, in the magnet, and um, one of the suggestions is the same brain, brain mechanism is related to both of those parts of decision making. That'd be really cool if that, if that worked out. Um, so that, these are all things for the future, but your question is what we think about all the time. 
Okay. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, age, um, people get less impulsive as they get older. And if you, if you think about the age when people are really engaged in risky behavior, it's like adolescence, right? Um, they have almost no concept uh, of, of, of risk. And it's interesting because these two processes that I'm talking about, uh, this idea of reward processes drawing you to things and self-control processes develop at different rates. So babies um, already have the reward mechanisms built in. Um, they can already experience reward. It's all built in for them. But the self-control processes develop much, much slower. These, these frontal cortex um, ideas develop way slower. And people think they don't actually mature until early adulthood. And I, I'm convinced in some people, they've, they've never matured. <laughs> There's still some people who are 40 and still super impulsive. But if you have highly developed reward mechanism set up for you, and you don't have the self-control, it's going to be a challenge. And adolescence is the perfect example of people who are really impulsive and do all kinds of risky behavior. Um, and their frontal, their, 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 the processes that would be used to control that just are not fully developed yet. Very good question. Yes? Scratching the oh. probably. So I, oh, go ahead. Yep, go better. Uh, thank you, Dr. Epstein. So uh, this may be like a kind of contention, but you, you talked about how uh, applied science can inform or somehow like guide. Exactly. They feedback. I think that the challenge um, is um, that there are separate groups. Oftentimes, there are separate groups of people. There's the basic scientists, then there's the clinicians. And they don't often read the basic science, but when a big discovery happens, they might get excited and apply it or think they understand the process and not go through the right steps to take it from bench to bedside. Is, as you said before. The, to me, the ideal situation is if people, it's the same person does it, or a team that's working together does it, as opposed to the basic scientist, and then there's the clinician over here, and they're not really talking, they're not thinking together. But I, I think having um, multiple levels of analysis working together is hard, no doubt. It doesn't happen all that often, but when it does happen, you get, that's where you get the major discoveries in the bench to bedside. Very good question. So uh, I think we'll uh, have to wrap it up. I just want to say that uh, the last second last comments there about <clears throat> some people not ever learning to delay gratification and aging. Somehow I knew we'd get to politics eventually, but we don't need to go beyond that. But anyway, thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Epstein. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody goes out and reads in areas they're not working on in science. And when you go to dinner, Remember to look at the dessert tray after you have a second chance there. So once again, please join me in thanking Dr. Epstein for a great lecture.